Come on into Forward Progress presented by the Hammer Betting Network. I'm your host, Eric Pollock from the Gold Sheet, with our two guests, Eric Eager from Sumer Sports and Suma Professional Sports Better. I want to remind everybody, like, subscribe, and share the video to help support the channel. And all comments will be read in real time. So if you want to comment, make sure you subscribe to have access to commenting. We're talking NFL draft headlines today. And before we get into that, we're going to talk about Pinnacle Sportsbook is the world's sharpest sports book offered competitive odds for 25 years. We preach line shopping on this channel, and with everyday competitive odds, Pinnacle should be one of your available outs. To support the show and the network, if you're looking to sign, uh, sign up to Pinnacle, use code HAMMER when signing up. Your trusted sports for 25 years, bet smart, bet Pinnacle, must be 19 plus in Ontario. Please play responsibly, it is not available in the U.S., so, like I just mentioned, we are talking NFL draft, and we're going about this a little bit of a unique way. We're going to be discussing some potential headlines that we might see the day after the first round of the NFL draft concludes. Then I'm going to ask Suma and Eric how likely I, we, they believe these scenarios to be, and if not, what they actually expect to happen. So let's get right into it. So imagine seeing a headline the next day after the draft that the Minnesota Vikings execute a bold move. They trade up using picks number 23 and 11 to secure the quarterback of the future. Right now, J.J. McCarthy being seen at about plus 110 in the one-way market to be drafted by the Minnesota Vikings. I'll throw over to you, Suma. What percentage do you give the Vikings moving up in the draft? And if they do move up, who do you have them selecting? About 50-50-ish right now. Like, almost every mock still has them trading up into the top five, like fourth or fifth spot. But it's been really calm since that Texans draft pick swap trade. And Adam Schefter has been reporting yesterday that the Texas approached the Vikings about the trade. So it wasn't necessarily the Vikings trying to get more MU for potentially trading out in, in this draft. Could be a total smoke screen. But I think right now I'm thinking that there might be a scenario in which the Vikings don't aggressively try to trade up pre-draft. And we might not even see it during draft day. So maybe they are going to wait more. Like right now they would potentially on basically trade up for the quarterback four in this draft, which seems to be like JJ McCarthy because everyone has Jane Daniels and Drake May uh, slotted in uh, second and, and third right now. So it would basically be, or the favorite right now would be JJ McCarthy. I don't get the sense that teams are going to uh, trade up and shoot up the draft board for Bonix or Michael Penix. No, so um, probably JJ McCarthy, but I think, or I'm thinking about the scenario of maybe Minnesota not trading up into the top five. Maybe they try uh, try to trade up later when someone falls, or maybe they even stick to uh, eleven and um, get try to get their quarterback later. Yeah, it makes total sense. They have options having two first round picks and can make a decision to either send it on up to the top five or just sit back at eleven. Eric, what do you have percentage-wise for the Vikings to trade up? If so, who do you have them selecting? And if not, what do you expect them to do if they stand put at 11? Firstly, however you want to pronounce Michael Penix, Penix is perfectly fine, okay? So you can't <laughs> you can't spell your name that way and not expect it. It's it's on you. Uh, so Suma is perfectly fine <laughs> pronouncing it that way. A no harm, no foul. Uh I think it's about 60-40 they do move up um, because this whole thing for Minnesota has gotten them to this point, right? They they went in, you know, Brad Holmes started a year before Quasi Adafo-Mensa. Ryan Poles was reportedly the favorite to be hired as Minnesota's general manager in 2022. They went with Quasi after Ryan Poles became the, the Chicago Bears general manager. Poles tore it down. Adapo Mensa went with the famed uh, competitive rebuild. And so it's all gotten them to this point. Now, funny, the Vikings did have one really good season and one kind of mess season. Both the, the Lions and the Packers have won more playoff games during the competitive part of the Vikings competitive rebuild. But it's gotten them to this point. If the Vikings get to this quarterback draft and don't get one of the blue chip quarterbacks, it's going to look really bad. For Quasi. Uh, so I think that they do feel like they have to come out of this with that. Now, they have way more intel than the public does. And as as I said last time I was, you know, we did the show together, you know, what the commanders do at two 
has really opaque. They have Adam Peters with the Niners. They don't leak stuff. Schefter believes he knows stuff. But Schefter believed he knew stuff about the 49ers when they were taking Mac Jones in 2021 as well. So I don't believe a lick of what Schefter believes about the commanders and picking at two. And so I just think that it's really – I think the Vikings are thinking about Drake May. I think they're going to do what it takes to get Drake May. I think the J.J. McCarthy stuff is to the Vikings is a little bit of a consolation prize that the Vikings are not going to settle for. That, to me, I think that the 60-40, they're going to come out and we're going to wake up on Friday and the Vikings are going to have Drake May because the, the New England Patriots are not a good enough football team to incorporate a young quarterback and to be successful in 2024. And that ends up being what the Vikings pay up for on draft night. That's exactly what I was going to follow up with, but you just mentioned at the end there. Like right now, Jaden Daniels is the favorite to go number two. Whether or not that is going to be true will remain to be seen. But in order for the Vikings to get Drake May, Washington would have to select Daniels at two because Washington is certainly not trading back from two. So putting it at 60-40 that the Vikings could even get more active than picking the favorite right now, J.J. McCarthy, and even leapfrogging into the number three hole to go for a quarterback like Drake May. But that's all going to be contingent on what Washington ends up doing at number two. But let's keep it moving. We'll stay in the top five. The next potential headline for the second day of the NFL draft, in a twist of fate, the Chargers opt to stay put at number five, enhance their overall arsenal with a draft pick. Right now, the Chargers are favorites to draft an offensive lineman, or they're laying chalk to draft an offensive lineman. A little bit of plus money for the Chargers to draft a wide receiver. Go back to you, Eric. What are you thinking with the Chargers? Do you think that they do what they should do as a good football team under Harbaugh and just bolster that offensive line, keep Herbert healthy, or after getting rid of Mike Williams and Keenan Allen with some talent in this draft at the receiver position, do they add a weapon? Well, I think that um, Joe Hurtis with uh, Corey Craywick, who came from the Ravens, both of them came from the Ravens, a team that traded back a lot. They traded back. Uh, numerous times throughout the process with Baltimore. I think the first step for the Ravens, or sorry, for the Chargers with the old Ravens front office is going to be to try to trade back. I think if they can't trade back, I think that they do take a wide receiver at five, whether that be Malik Neighbors, because all four quarterbacks go one through four, and it's Marvin Harrison. Or if it, it, it if it ends up being uh, just, you know, one, two, three, uh, and and they end up getting a chance at Harrison at five. They take Harrison. I, I think it ends up being one of um, neighbors or Harrison at five. I do not think that they would take a right tackle, which will end up being that position at five at the natural pick. I do not think that they would they would settle for that at that position. So in my opinion, it ends up being a trade back is their first choice. Uh, and then they go with something like Brock Bowers at, say, 11, uh, with Minnesota, 12 with Denver, although that's a, a divisional rival. Uh, the, uh, the Vegas Raiders at 13, another divisional rival. I think they try to trade back, and then and then they get somebody like Bowers, which is a more acceptable pick later in the first round. Uh, or if they stay at five, they'll get their pick of the litter at wide receiver, whether that be Harrison if the first four picks are quarterbacks, or it's Neighbors if the first three picks are quarterbacks, and then it's Harrison at four. And then – I think Alt or Fashanu is like a, a, a little bit of a longer shot for them at five because they have Rashawn Slater there. I do not think that they go with a right tackle at five, uh, given their their initial investment in Rashawn Slater, who's been a good tackle for them. Sue, I want to get your thoughts on what the Chargers are going to do at five, but I want to circle back quickly to a question from Beat Gamer 99 Back to the Vikings. Do you think that their plan A is to hope that Drake, Drake May is there at three, and then their plan B is Penix or Knicks at 13 or 27? Or do you think their plan A is to just wait it out? What do you see those probabilities looking like? Yeah, I, I agree with Eric that that plan A is likely not J.J. McCarthy, but a guy like Drake May. Uh, then maybe J.J. McCarthy. And then when it comes to these quarterbacks like Penix, Phoenix, or Bo Nix, I mean – cannot really see them overshooting for them like there are so many scenarios where the vikings could be attacking at the at, at the back of the first round or something so lots of scenarios there but i mean everything that i've heard about these quarterbacks like michael panics at 13 uh, uh 11 doesn't really scream 
uh, attached to me right now. Yep, totally understand. But now let's go back to the Chargers. So would you expect them to tr want to trade back? Or do you think that the headline of the Chargers staying put, going to draft a wide receiver like a Marvin Harrison, if he's there, or even Malik Neighbors is more likely? I, I think it's probably more than 50% because you need a good trade partner to execute such a trade. I completely agree with Eric that they would like uh, to to uh, trade back potentially. And then I would also throw in some right tackles there. Let's say they trade back into the 11, 12, 13 range. Like there are like the, the prime Greg Roman right tackles. Like Talise Foraga is like a lab, lab made right tackle for Greg Roman and for, for, for Harbour. Like in, incredible run blocker, um, just mauling over people. Um, JC Latham, uh, super athletic, also a, a, a great choice. Um, to, to pair with Slater on the right side. So uh, I, I think that the Charters would like this scenario where they get a good trade, maybe a 2025 20, first round pick in a in a package and, and then try to get some of these um, blue slash red chip guys later. But if they stay put, I mean, if you look at this wide receiver depth chart right now, it's super hard for me not to expect them to take a wide receiver at, at five. Gotcha. So the Los Angeles Chargers uh, options at number five overall pick. Now let's do a little bit more discussion on the quarterback. So the next headline is deja vu in the 2024 NFL draft. It's a shock as Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. remain undrafted into round two after four QBs go early. Right now, quarterbacks taking the first round over four and a half is juiced pretty heavily to minus 220, under four and a half plus 180 sumo. Would you be very shocked if Knicks and Penix do not go in the first round? And what probability do you put it at for them to go in the first and to not go in the first? I would not be shocked at all. Um, I, I think right now it, it's, it's most likely that, that one of those guys makes it into the first round. But I also would not be shocked at this point right now because we always see this historically with like some guys like quarterback four, quarterback five shooting up the, the, the draft bros. Boards, the, the the rumors, news, and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden they go in rounds two or three. So I wouldn't be shocked at all. I think Bo Nix right now, it's uh, I think his soft over under is thirty two and a half. I think that's a pretty good range right now. And Michael Penix, um, Benjamin Albright made the point the other day that um, NFL people were pretty low on him going into the the off season and. He doesn't believe that all of a sudden it's it's just media catching up. So just a nugget um, to to throw in there. Um, I mean, right now, over four and a half quarterbacks, of course, is is more likely because we also see all these mocks with Bo Nix at um, 12 to Denver. Um, then sometimes we even see Michael Penix drafted um, by the Ra Ra Raiders or someone trading up into round one. But I would not be shocked if we uh, were looking at the at the draft board like two weeks from now, one day before the draft, and then all of a sudden odds have shifted and we are not as confident anymore in more than four quarterbacks getting drafted there. Yeah, and speaking of potential mock drafts, so Max Chavik released a mock draft with six quarterbacks dra being drafted in the top 13. He had Bo Nix to Denver at 12 and Penix to Las Vegas at 13. Eric, toss me, what's the percentage of six quarterbacks going in the top 15 picks of the 2024 NFL draft? I mean, these things are like really spiky, right? So I would say it's probably 25%. It, it's going to be, it, it's not smooth. If if there's a run on QBs, I think Knicks and Penix being very similar to each other means the likelihood that five and six quarterbacks, so maybe maybe it's actually a little bit higher, actually. Probably very – five and six are probably similar. So maybe it's um, – you know, so over four and a half is minus 220. So maybe it's – yeah, maybe it's more like 50%. Uh, you know, they're probably closer to each other than we think. Um, I'm I'm still on the side of, of Sumo where I think because you've seen the history of this thing, 2018 under five and a half was a cinch. It was almost under four and a half. You were sweating Lamar Jackson – Drew Locke in 2019, that was the under. He went in the second round. Deshaun Kaiser in 2017, that was the under. Uh, Jordan Love actually went in round one, but that was a that was the the push of four quarterbacks in round one. Uh, you had Levis last year. You had 
uh, you know, uh, Jalen Hurts in 2020. It almost always is that last quarterback that doesn't make it in. And the question is, is like, is that last quarterback Knicks or Penix or both in this in this one? And I tend to think of them as a pair. If the, if one goes in round one, I think both will. Um, and I tend to believe that at market prices, namely plus 180, I'm taking under. Um, and, and but at the same time, you know, I, I do respect that. Do respect his opinion there, uh, given given some of the info. I will say his mock draft a, a few years ago had Jordan Love going 13th to the Colts. Uh, that was before the divorce Buckner trade. But again, these things are these things are fluid. These NFL teams, they always prefer players near the line of scrimmage, linemen, D linemen. Once those blue chip guys come off the board at the quarterback position, they don't want anything to do, especially now that the fifth year option on quarterbacks are super is super expensive. Jordan Love, his fifth year option was like 25 million bucks before even starting a game for the backers. That meant anything. They don't really want to buy into a quarterback uh, if he's not considered like a top of the top of the top quarterback. Yeah, and it makes a ton of sense. Like you said, football games often one in the trenches without having a blue chip quarterback. Like they're not there. Teams would certainly look to probably fill in those gaps along the line of scrimmage. Before we get into some more headlines, quick reminder that the mock draft series on the Hammer Betting Network is on the clock where Rob Pizzola runs through all 32 NFL teams and mocks the first three rounds of the NFL draft. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you do not miss out on the series. Have some great guests, have some great um, understanding and insight into the NFL draft process. So make sure you subscribe to see the On the Clock series with Rob Pizzola. I want to hop to a question quickly from the audience here. Um, we talked about this a little bit last week, but we'll get into it a little bit more. Um, whoever wants to take this one first can hop in, but how much do you guys read into top 30 visits and how do you believe that the organizations treat these visits is a question from Arthur Dominguez. It depends. So some teams love their 30 visits. Like I think the Cowboys are pretty high on, on top, top 30 visits. Um, some other teams don't care about it. I think Peter Skoronsky was an example last year who, who went very high, but the Titans didn't even had have him on it. Top 30 visits visit when I remember correctly. Um, and then it's also like how this, how are teams distributing their um, top 30 visits? Like there are some teams that maybe go heavy into one position where you can get some hints. Um, some other teams like the Bears, for example, the Bears are holding visits for lots of guys that will go um, beyond their pick, but maybe it's, it's basically uh, just to, to get to know those players and maybe go after them in the second round, maybe trade up at some point if, if, if some of these guys um, goes down the board. So it, it, it just depends on the, on the situation. For example, the Packers, I think they have had three visits with, with linebackers. So does it mean they want to target a, a linebacker late in the first round, or is it just to, to, to get to get after them um, with their two second round picks? So it, it depends um, from team to team. That depends from team to team. No uh, secret sauce in those visits. Certainly cases where players that go to those visits are drafted, other cases where they're clearly not, and also cases where they don't even have a visit, yet they still find themselves selected in the first round, but let's get to some more headlines for the first round of the 2024 NFL draft. We got one here. Now this is a very intriguing one because there is a ton of talent, but if you see this headline, the 2024 NFL draft makes history ties 2004 record with seven wide receivers selected in the first round right now, over six and a half is about plus 140 under six and a half minus 175. Eric, you got guys like Romo Dunze, Marvin Harrison, Jr. Brian Thomas, Malik neighbors looking like first round locks, but, are there other receivers you think that can get into that first round to help tie that record set in 2004? What probability do you put that at? I would put it at about 25%. I just think that in these, I, I'll say, I say I'm boring with this, but the teams prefer line of scrimmage players. And the other part, and I just did a mock draft kind of internally, and here's where I can't, here's, here are my distributions. And I, and and this is this comes from a guy who doesn't think that five you know five quarterbacks are going. I went six quarterbacks, six wide receivers, one tight end, nine O line, five D line, five corners. That's how I got to thirty two. Now we always have a Jack Campbell, uh, 
Travis Etienne, a we always have some bull, bullshit, right? Where a guy team drafts a running back, a linebacker, something like that. That's going to take away from a wide receiver. That's not going to take away from a lineman. That's not going to take away from a D lineman. That's not going to take away from – it's going to – when teams do the unexpected stuff and take take non-premium positions, it's going to come from wide outs and quarterbacks and corners, right? Because that's how teams are. They like the big boys. They like – and then they like players near the middle of the field. Never bet the over on wide receivers in the first round of the draft because that's not what teams like to do. And the way that the draft curves go, it's flat. Like – these teams think that they can get wide receivers from pick 32 to 42, 42 to 50. And so I, I right now don't think that that's the case. And I, and when I look at this thing, I actually think that you're, you're much better off. Um, if you can get like an alt under like four and a half, five and a half wide receivers at a really plus price to me, that's a, that's a, actually a better gamble than over uh, six and a half at wide receiver. Yeah, they give you a great point. If you just look at the last couple of drafts, there are so many times where teams are more than willing to just draft and re bolster their wide receiver court in the second, third, fourth round, and so on. So many wide receivers that run kind of begin sometimes in the second round. Because, like you said there, Eric, that teams are prioritizing the trenches. And that's going to, or if they do have those weird picks like a Will McDonald, per se, or some others, you can go across to that. That's taking away from a receiver being drafted. And it not- never comes at the expense of linemen. Or guards, you know, tackles, guards, D line, you know, tack, you know, edge players. It always comes at the expense of wide receivers. And again, it like that's just the way it goes. That's just the way it goes. And it makes a ton of sense when you really think about it. Suma, talk to me. Any shot that we're going to tie the 2004 record with seven wide receivers selected in the first round? You agree with Eric here? Uh, I agree with Eric. Um, when you look at the board right now, so we have like four locks. Uh, the big three, then we have Brian Thomas, and I think Adonai Mitchell is also a, a good pick to go in the first round, but that brings us to five. And then we need like two more, like Xavier Worthy or Let McConkey. I don't know. So it seems like almost impossible right now. Um, the mean outcome for my mock tracking right now is 5.8, median is six. And that's basically guys fitting in people like um, Led McConkey, Xavier Leggett popped up in like uh, one or two mock drafts. So very hard to see Sam. Yeah, totally understandable. Now let's take a little bit more of a dive into the top 10. So another headline, surprise in the top 10, tight end Brock Bauer is still available as the first round progresses. He's currently plus 105 to go in the top 10. Suma, what teams do you think are the most likely to draft him? And what position and what percentage do you put on Bowers being a top 10 pick and then not being a top 10 pick? Bowers is super, super interesting when going through mock draft scenarios because I think there are like two spots in, in the top 10 that make initially sense that are Chicago and the Jets. Um, and then I like I wouldn't be surprised if he falls if he gets past past the, the Jets because then we are looking at spots like the Colts at 15, Bengals at 18, uh, maybe Rams. So I think there's a chance that if the Jets don't bite, there is not a spot in the top 14 for him. So over under right now, I think we are in the in the 11 and a half range. Makes, makes good sense. Over got bet over the weekend um, because if the Jets don't take him, like he could easily slide. And... Um, Eric's colleagues from from Sumo Sports talked about the the draft curve, especially for tight ends. Uh, I think Eric will tell us something about that soon. Um, so super tough to 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 mock a tight end outside of the Jets in the top ten right now or in the top forty. Yeah, and we discussed this a little bit last week. How the Jets, being the Jets, are probably going to select a guy like Bowers when they certainly should focus on the offensive line instead. But um, we touched on this a little bit even earlier in the show, Eric, but. You really think that, or what percentage you put that Bowers makes it to the top ten, and if not, really, how far is he going to slide? Yeah, it, it really is just a bet on the Jets, right? So I, I think that, um, given, yeah, given where they are, I think Bowers probably falls. Um, 
further to Suma's point. I, uh, Cincinnati could be a position, but you know when you look at Cincinnati's draft history, they take premium position players a year before they need them. Uh, Miles Murphy uh, got you know Dax Hill was is kind of more of a corner um, type player. They needed him a year before they lost you know players in the secondary. So yeah, it, it's a free fall. I think it, I think you're basically going to get a team training up for him uh into the 20s if he falls past the jets uh so no i i i would i would say at market prices i would not bet on bowers to go in round one or sorry round in top 10. totally understandable um again like you said a trade it would literally be a scenario where if the jets are drafting him he'll be in that and he'll cash that ticket but if not very hard to see any other team selecting him in the top 10 and how far he slides would be uh soon be determined Another headline, Bills deja vu, Diggs trade sparks wide receiver first round pick for Buffalo. Bills, minus 300 in a one-way market to draft a wide receiver, so clearly that's where the market's head is at. But let's talk about some of the receivers. We mentioned a bunch of names we had this discussion already. Who is the best fit to land in Buffalo if they go receiver? And if they don't, what other positions can you see the Buffalo Bills drafting? Uh, Brandon Ayuk and T. Higgins, like... Give me both uh, getting uh, passes fr from Josh Allen like easily. And um, I mean, Buffalo has the 28th pick, like something that we saw with Marquise Hollywood um, or AJ Brown, something like a maybe a, a, a draft day trade where they sent their, their late first round pick, something like that I could easily see. Yeah, they, they would need to... They don't have a ton of wiggle room to trade for a veteran at this point with just $3 million in cap space. Um, they'd probably, yeah, it, it would be tough for them to do anything. But uh, I don't necessarily know if taking a wide receiver with the first pick is is as big of a lot. I, I just don't, I don't believe in laying that big of a price for something in the NFL draft just because these teams – are not thinking about these things on the order of one year, especially Brandon Bean, who's built a team that has won four consecutive AFC East titles, has been in the you know second round of the playoffs or, or later every single year for the last four years. And he is not thinking about, I need to draft a player with this pick to win this year. Like if, if that, if that's his problem, then he's got bigger problems than we think. So to me, you got to look like further down the list. That team needs offensive line help. That team needs defensive line help to replace Von Miller. That team needs cornerback play because they got rid of White and Kahir Elam was a complete disaster as a pick. I, I I agree with Suma that like a veteran wide receiver is really what this team needs. The problem is to make a trade for that player, they got to be cap compliant upon the trade. And it's mm -hmm. so it's like they don't. When you look at their cap table, it's a freaking disaster. They don't have. They don't have a move to make to to get Ayuk's fifth year option under the cap with a trade. So I don't know if they can do it unless they do a sign and trade deal. What they don't do in the NFL really. So I just think the Bills are eating their vegetables this year, which everybody believes that that means that they're going to draft a wide receiver. But the wide receivers don't produce in year one for the most part, and so to me, it just means that Bean and company are going to do something more long term with their pick. Yeah, we had this conversation again last week when we talked draft about how you have to take a look at some of these teams' cap situations, not for the upcoming year, but one, two, three, four years out to see who they might pick in the first round because they're going to have to eventually probably replace that player. And if you want to get a premium position in the first round, have that fifth-year option, you need to be more in tune with what the team has to deal with cap-wise, not just this next year, but a couple of years down the line as well. So very great point. And we're going to go to our last headline here. Trade saga unfolds. Star wide receivers Brandon Ayuk or T. Higgins reportedly traded for first-round draft pick amidst their public demand to be traded. Suma, what are the chances of both of them being traded? What are the chances of just one? And what are the chances of neither of them being traded? And who are some teams that might be targeting either T. Higgins or Brandon Ayuk for a first-round draft pick? Chance either of, uh, either of those gets traded on draft pick probably in the, I don't know, 15 to 20 percent range just shooting from the hip right now um t higgins i mean yes they can let him play on the option but what's going to happen next year and um brendan ayuk um i don't really buy that the 49ers necessarily think they 
need or want to get rid of him. So um, doesn't make too much sense. Higgins, I can understand with with all the contracts coming up for for Jama Chase and um, Joe Burrow, but 49ers, Brandon Ayuk, I, I would not really get it in the first place. So I would probably lean more towards Higgins if I, if I had to bet, off, bet on anyone getting traded. Um, Higgins, I mean, yes, Buffalo, we, we talked about it. Um, I mean, Arizona, if they don't get their uh, blue chip wide receiver early, maybe they trade down and don't get either of, either of the top three guys. Arizona could be a, a potential um, destination. Um, Jacksonville is not looking that great on the outside. That would be a, a uh, slot, for instance. But then it gets really thin when thinking about potential draft day trades, in my opinion. I think I also have to peg the, uh, the next question. Are either of those two players even worth a first-round pick in the first place? Yuk is totally worth a first round pick. Um, he's quite good. It, you know, I think most people in the league believe he's worth it. Um, I think when I ask around people in the NFL, um, I think Higgins, it's a much like it's it's much less clear. Um, I think Ayuk is is believed to be by many a number one one number one receiver. The other part is the the costs are completely different. Ayuk has a one-year base salary of $14 million. Um, that's significantly less than when you look at uh, Higgins. With, Higgins has to come over on a one-year 21.8. So if you look at the, the teams with, with, you know, with cap space, the only teams that are able to make that trade for Higgins on draft night are basically Packers and up. So Packers, Bears, Chiefs, Bengals, Texans, Raiders, Lions, Cardinals, Chargers, Eagles, Titans, Commanders, Patriots. Those are the only teams that can trade for Higgins. You can go all the way down to Rams, Vikings, Colts, Broncos, Jaguars to teams that can trade for Ayuk. So more than half the league can trade for Ayuk on draft night, which is which adds to the mystique. Adds to the mystique. And given the fact that Ayuk is better and cheaper, I think Ayuk has a shot. Like a team like the Colts could like very well, uh, you know, you add him on a to a rookie contract quarterback in Richardson, who I think all of us believe is pretty good. That could make uh, a lot of waves as well. Um, so yeah, there, there. I think there's a really, really good chance that IU gets traded. I don't think Higgins does, in large part because of the, the cost. But the other part is, I think he pe- teams think he's more worth like the 35th pick and not like the 25th pick. Gotcha, and that makes a ton of sense. So going back to that discussion though, Eric, with Brandon IU, you mentioned being definitely worth the first round pick. I'm sure he's asking for a hefty price tag as he's assuming he's looking at the wire receiver market and licking his own chops. Do you think it's more probable that the Niners trade him or get a deal done? Because Ayuk's probably wanting around 30 million, and that's might be slightly too high for Ayuk, even though he's great, but that's uh that's real wire receiver money right there. Yeah, I think the issue is is when you look at the Niners, we talked about this on this on this network uh, a ton. Going into the offseason, they had five non-quarterbacks with $20 million cap hits or more. They got rid of Armstead. They they did some work on some contracts, but now Trent Williams has a thirty one point five million dollar cap hit. Debo Samuel twenty eight point six. Ward's at eighteen. Bosa, McCaffrey, Ayuk are all at fourteen. You have to eventually, after this season, probably pay Brock Purdy. You know, it it, it starts to add up, right? And you've already committed a lot to these non quarterbacks. You know, that that I think is where it gets tough and you have to make some tough decisions. And, you know, the, the Chiefs, for example, they chose Chris Jones. They had to trade Legereus Sneed. A lot of people felt like they didn't get a great return for Sneed, but it's mostly because you had to make the choice not to pay him. I think in this case, they probably have to make the choice to get a return for Ayuk and give up the and get the cap space in return. And a lot of people are going to say, well, you probably chose to keep the worst of the two wide receivers in Debo Samuel. But that's the cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. Couldn't have said it better myself. But that's going to wrap it up for our headlines for today and for the show. But before we get off, I want to plug one more thing. Download the Sumer Sports free 2024 NFL Rookie Guide. Advanced analytics, future projections, all from Eric Eager and his great company. Eric, want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, for sure. That And this is a really good work done by our data scientists, uh, headed up by Tej Seth and, and our 
a director of communication, Sean Syed. They did a phenomenal work on this. It, it's free, download it. It's really good for fantasy players, especially players who play in, in dynasty leagues, but also best ball leagues. Uh, and yeah, and uh, that'll be a great lead into our draft show, which will be Friday, or the Thursday nights uh, on our YouTube channel. It'll be myself, Thomas Dimitrov, a few of our correspondents from, De- from Detroit, where the draft is. And then on Saturday morning, myself and Thomas Dimitrov will be on Sirius XM previewing round three of the draft uh, on channel 88. So it'll be a really fun uh, weekend of draft stuff uh, from us at Sumer Sports. Sounds like an absolute great time. So make sure you go check that out and download that guy. It is free again, the Sumer Sports 2024 NFL Rookie Guide. But that's going to do it for the show. We'll see you guys same time next week. Make sure again to like the video, subscribe to the channel and share the content to help the channel grow. Back same time, same place on behalf of the Hanbury Network. I'm Eric Ploy from the Gold Sheet. Eric Eager from Sumer Sports and professional sports better Suma. We'll see you guys next time.